everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to make a lure. And uh, I, I, that's something that uh, I really got into making a lot of lures. A lot of people know me as the trapping dude because I wrote the book on trapping. And if you haven't gotten a copy already, go to Western Sporting. Uh, this is your how-to book on how to properly catch uh, a bird of prey, whether you're a falconer, wildlife educator, uh, a bird bander, whatever. So people are always teasing me. They're like, hey, it's the trapping dude. But uh, for years, I always made lures. And I sold them. I made custom lures. And here's what I found out. It, it, there's falconry in all different parts of the world. America, of all of our falconry equipment, some of the greatest hood makers on earth are in the United States. There's some amazing craftsmen. Uh, there's amazing Jess braiders and leash braiders. There's all kinds of new equipment being made. You know, a ball bearing uh, fitted uh, Arabic block perches, just amazing equipment and pioneering new forms of radio and uh, GPS telemetry. So uh, Americans seem to have a lot of respect for their equipment, but not lures. Can you think of anybody who's like, that's a lure guy? And the lure is an afterthought. And because of that, I started making lures for my apprentices and for other people, and then I started selling them. And here's what I found out. If you haven't found this out already, if you're new to falconry, you'll of course find out that falconers are stubborn and opinionated. Well, if you think falconers are opinionated, wait till you ask them about lures. You could have 10 falconers that all use the exact same training techniques, but their opinions on lures and what a lure should look like and how it should be constructed, all of those people will be radically different. And so because of that, when I set out to make lures, I listened to different people's views. None of their points were wrong. They all had valid points, even though some of those points conflicted. Uh, some people, it was all about cleanliness. I, there's one guy who makes lures out of old uh, bicycle tire inner tubes that he cuts up, binds them, makes them look like a squid, and they're just like, well, that's the ugliest, weirdest thing on earth. And it works because it's completely waterproof, and it's easy to bind to, and he's like, and it's, it's cheap. So he would make his own that way. Other people uh, would want me to make lures for them that were hyper-realistic. They whether it was a rabbit lure that they wanted me to put a fake head on and make it, or whether they wanted me to make a, 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 a sage grouse lure and paint it, hand paint it, to look as real as possible. There's some people that want just a very basic form, and then they want to attach dried pigeon wings or dried pheasant wings to it. All of these things have merit. Some people use a lure... Uh, almost exclusively to train their bird to dive, to be like, hey, I want you to stoop back and forth and you're gonna get your exercise that way. It's very amazing to watch a bird stooping to the lure. Um, for some people, it's just about retrieval. Some people want a very heavy lure with the intention that hopefully the bird won't carry it off. Some people want it as light as possible because if a bird is hitting it, then you know it has always the risk of damaging its feet. So because of this, all over the years, I came up with just an incredible range of patterns. These are just a few of them, and you can see, you know, some of them have a hole in the middle for the food to be displayed on. Uh, some of them have uh, are meant for spinning. Some of them, um, some of them are maybe you know meant to look more like a living bird, and some even were just big giant rectangles that that custom made, and they'd form just a big tube when they were sewn together. So my point about that is that there's uh, there's a lot of ways to achieve a lot of goals when it comes to lures. If you follow my channel, you know that I'm training a new lander falcon that hatched this year. It's a first year bird, he's a few months old. He's doing very well, and I've started to introduce a lure to him, but I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna make him his own lure, show how to make a lure for this video, and then that'll be it'll be a neat thing to do. Now, because of that, for me personally, I've done I've stooped birds to the lure, I've had them chase fake rabbits, all kinds of things. But my biggest priority is the safety of the bird for retrieval. So for me, a lure is a Hail Mary pass. Meaning if your bird is out there, woo, it's getting up there, flying around, and all of a sudden you see an eagle or some gun hunter comes and starts illegally shooting at your bird or a bigger hawk's chasing your falcon, I want them to be able to come back instantaneously and know, hey, look, come back now, and that's what the lure's for. So even though I will train birds to stoop and dive to the lure anymore, it's more about I want this to be the guaranteed thing that they're going to return to. <clears throat> so, uh, also, I want it to, in some ways, incite in their mind the idea of hunting. So, what the pattern I'm picking is uh, this lander falcon, I'm going to be hunting a lot on pigeons and chucker partridge. And so, because of that, I want something that has kind of that look of a game bird. He obviously knows it's not a life bird, but I want the feather tips to show. 
so that he'll kind of think, oh, oh, I see movement, okay? And I'm also choosing to do two colors. And the reason why I do two colors, red, when you have red, red can incite that idea of huh? blood, food, eating. Uh, it's, 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 a tr it's a positive triggering color for them. Same thing with humans, by the way. I don't know if you know this in marketing. Think how many food places you know have red or yellow or orange or light browns. That is an intentional marketing thing because those things are associated with food and we also see those and get hungry. Well, I, so I'm gonna do red and brown and I'm going to have a swivel built inside so that the lure itself can spin um, and I am not putting any ties for food on and I'll explain why here in a bit. So I picked my pattern out. Now the next step is to go ahead and get my leather. The leather I'm using is uh, very thick the brown leather is an oil skin that uh, is fairly waterproof. The other one is very, the red is very water resistant. So I'm going to take my pattern and I'll just trace it with a magic marker. And going through this whole tracing process, pretty cut and dry, right? This red leather is the same on both sides. But if you're being a little picky and you don't want any of that marker to show, then maybe you make sure that the side that's going to be inside of the lure is the side that you draw the marker on, okay? Once I have this uh, red section all traced, of course I cut it. Now the scissors I use, you use, you use whatever works obviously. Uh, Ginger makes leather scissors. They're a bit pricey, but if you're going to do a lot of leather working, the Ginger leather scissors are incredible and last for a long time and they slice right through leather like uh, you're cutting paper. Now uh, I'm doing something a little different. This could, this is normally, this pattern that I'm using is normally a three piece lure, meaning I have a front side, a back side, and the tail, and I have those all separate colors. In this case, I'm just going for ease. It's actually, I found surprisingly difficult to film yourself sewing upside down while watching the screen. So uh, forgive the imperfections of this video, but uh, because of that, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to incorporate the tail section of the pattern right into the uh, brown side of the body. So I'm gonna trace the tail out first, and then once I get that done and ready, then I'm gonna go ahead and hook the body part on and trace the rest of that and cut that out as well. Now the section we're going to do now is what most people would think of as sewing. We're not going to sew a lure. We are going to lace a lure. Let me tell you what the difference is. Sewing is when you have a sewing needle and you're just sewing, okay? Lacing is when you have pre-punched holes and then you are lacing thread or sinew or leather through those. Okay, why this is way better, it, uh, the leathers we're using are tough, they're stiff, and, and again, I want to acknowledge, there's all kinds of leathers you could do. There are people who are adamant that they want no stitching on the outside of their lure. I have a friend here in the state who's a master hood maker who is incredible, and he stitches his lures the same way he stitches his hoods. And every time I see that, I'm like, you put like a billion hours on that. These are micro stitches halfway through. I'm like, no lure is worth that. But that's he's he's a master craftsman, and that's what he does. And it works. It's not a right or a wrong way. That is his way. I'm doing something that's durable, but uh, I don't want to take a million years to have to make this lure. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, pre-punch the holes on one side. We're gonna take a leather punch. There's all different varieties. Uh, this is a handheld one that you just squeeze like a pair of pliers. And I'm gonna start working my way around, punching all the holes around the first side that does not have the tail. Once that is completed, then I'm gonna lay it on top of the other half. And I'm gonna take that magic marker and poke through the pre-punched holes so that they're gonna match up. And even when I was doing this, I screwed up a little and it was a little off. So that's why it's good. This is why I like lacing rather than sewing. You have your holes ahead of time, you're sure that it's going to line up properly. So you draw those in, you punch your holes in on the second half, and now you're ready to go. Now for this lure, I want to have a, um, some sort of a loop to hold on to. I want this lure to spin. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a small ball bearing swivel with a tiny little keychain piece and that's what I'm going to insert and incorporate inside around the head of this lure. This will make it spin. Now you have to put some thought into this because <clears throat> at this point you have to remember the more hardware that is sticking out of the lure that's metal, it, the, the more likely there is for an injury for your bird. 
So I want as much of this to be inside of the lure as possible. Now, another thing at this stage that I have to point out, I have the body ready. I have decided not to have any strings or straps sticking out to attach meat to. And the reason is, is for me personally, what I like to do is I like to train a bird to fly to the lure for food. And once they have figured that out, then I, and then I don't put food on it anymore. I have them come to an empty, ungarnished lure. And once they're on it, they're like, wait, where's the food? Then I hand the food to them next to them. And that way they're never going to grab food and fly off with the lure if they're a skittish individual. They're like, hey, I got some, wait, where's the food? So it's a step A, step B. And so that's what I've chosen for this. But I wanna show you one little tip about it if you chose to do so. So here's a little scrap of leather. And if this was the body, what I would do is if I wanted uh, some sort of drawstrings or some sort of straps to, to tie meat with, then I would punch a couple of holes that are fairly close together. And then I'd take a piece of whatever cordage I'm using. This is a nylon uh, wax-based, uh, so fairly waterproof thing that's used for making necklaces. It's very strong. I'm gonna tie two knots, and then I'm going to push the ends through the two holes. And then what you end up with is that knot on the inside prevents it from pulling out. If you don't do this, if you just thread it through the holes, then one of the problems you can run into is while the bird is eating, it may pull out the string and may even eat the string and then you're, and that's not good. So having that knot on the inside secures it. <clears throat> but again, I just wanted to show that to recognize, but that's not what I'm doing on my lure. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the, the lacing, the sewing or the lacing. Now, uh, because I want that, uh, a, that swivel in the center, I'm not gonna start there. This is going to have the most tension, the most stress is that swivel. So I want that part, I want the head, the swivel to be attached incredibly solidly. So I'm gonna start sewing or lacing a little to the side and I will start by lacing it through and tying a square knot and then leaving a big old tail on the end of that square knot which I just leave inside, I don't snip it short. Then I'm gonna sew through a couple of times then put the two sides together and start my lacing process. And once I get to, I make sure once I put the swivel in that I lace it in good and tight and I'm gonna go back and forth on the neck. So I'm gonna sew do 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 all one direction and then whoop, go right back the other way and then go back the original way I was going. So now I have this very secure. Once we have that neck finished and completed, uh, before I go on to the rest of the lure, because it's so narrow, it can be hard to get the stuffing or the batting inside. There are all kinds of things you can put inside of a lure. For me, uh, the lures I make for myself, usually I just use quilting batting, which you can just get at a fabric store. Or if you're desperate, just go to a thrift store, buy an old stuffed animal and take the stuffing from inside out. It's like build a bear, but build a lure. And so you're just going to push that in and make sure it's really firm because that also helps to anchor around where the swivel is on the inside of the neck of the lure and making more stability so it's going to spin better. Now, once you have that in, then you're just gonna continue sewing all the way around, just bit by bit. When you lace, I keep saying sewing, I know I mean to be saying lacing. When you lace to where you have just a couple inches left, you have a gap, an opening still, then you're gonna stop and you're gonna take more of that, that quilting batting and you're just going to put it inside. Everybody again on this part is going to have a different view even if you're making this style of lure. Some people want it really firm, some people want it barely stuffed at all and incredibly soft. But me personally, I like it uh, to be a fairly firm lure, something that the bird can really get a grip on but not so hard that it could hurt their feet if they hit it hard. And again, remember the way I'm usually using this, I'm swinging around and once they're coming, I'm just uh, gonna let it land on the ground and let them land on it. That's what I'm usually doing because I'm usually using my lure for retrieval, not for exercise. I'm doing hunting for exercising. So once that is all, all that batting is all in, then we're gonna just go ahead and finish lacing up. And then we have to lace all the way back the other direction. The reason why is again, we're trying to make a sturdy, stable device that can handle a lot of punishment from a bird attacking it and from it being swung around in weather conditions that may go from hot to freezing. And so, um, oh, I forgot to mention too. I don't know why I didn't mention this earlier. What I am lacing this up with is imitation sinew which is an artificial nylon uh, thing. You can find it online all over the place. You go to leather stores and it is wax covered as well. So it's nylon, very strong. 
and wax coated which makes it waterproof so that is very strong pull tension the entire time that you're lacing once you get it all the way back to the beginning how do you end it you could tie a knot but what I do is I just take the needle and poke it through so that the needle comes out in between the two sides of the lure and then I just cut it off and once you've done that you're you basically there you go you have a lure so <clears throat> that final lure again for me I like having the ability for it to spin uh, that's um, and again having two colors a lure that can spin that looks like motion that they can see that and again red can incite the desire to hunt while the dark and the whole shape looks like a some sort of a game bird which again somewhere in their genetic memory can be like wait that's, that's bird food right it's moving it's spinning spinning will help catch their visual attention better because you have light dark light dark or bright drab bright drab that huh what and it forces them to have to make some sort of a choice some sort of a response where if it's just a, a, a monochromatic lure single color it's just like that is less eye catching that's less movement um uh catching for their for their mind and for their eyes so that's how we do it so that's just a very basic lure again remember there are infinite versions of lures this is one way that works well i thought it would be fun to show the basics of how to lace and make your own lure from scratch uh do not view this as as the doctrine of this is what i claim a good lure is again Whatever uh, need you have, there's a lure for it. But just remember, this is just a basic lure that'll get you by and uh, help you retrieve your bird. So I hope you found this to be a useful and entertaining video. If you have any questions about lures or sewing or have comments on other videos you'd like me to make, please let me know down in the comments. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe. It really does help me build this channel up. And as always, happy hawking.